Welcome to uh, episode three of the Bernowski series. Has everyone here seen uh, t today's episode? Yeah. Within the last 20 years or so? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's old. Some people are coming to the meetings and uh, <clears throat> not having seen it recently. But they're, they're so memorable that you, I guess you, you don't need to. So actually, this is my favorite episode of all the episodes. This is the episode that shocked me. Because I, I have a whole library of BBC documentaries, especially those James Burke ones, like The Day the Universe Changed and Connections. Does anyone remember that? No, that, that, that's an incredible series. So I saw this and I thought, well, this is too poetic and it's too polished for me. It, it made me irritated. But then I saw this episode and I was just blown away. Um, we'll see why in a second. So let's go ahead and start with Daniel's intro which is right here. Welcome. Set to the following image of William Blake's The Ancient Days, episode three of our 13 part series begins with the following passage from Milton's Paradise Lost, book seven. In his hand, he took the golden compasses prepared in God's eternal stone to circumscribe this universe and all created things. One foot he centered, and the other turned, bound through the vast profundity obscure, and said, Thus far extend, thus far thy bounds. This be thy just circumference, O world. I like to imagine boundaries that are continued to be pushed, extended outward. The record of humanity begins with the movement of people. The migration of populations is our only origin story. All right. That seemed to work out. Oh, David's here. Welcome, David. Hi, David. All righty. So, uh, let's see. All right, here's the next little uh, video. This is the uh, introduction for the first clip. And here we go. David, there seems to be a flying saucer behind you to keep disappearing. <laughs> Try to get rid of it. <laughs> the following clip highlights the theory that man migrated to North America through the Bering Land Bridge. This theory, also known as Beringia, reminds me of Plato's Timaeus and the lost continent of Atlantis in that a lost geological landmass aided and abetted in the crime of existence, however mockingly facetious that sounds. My tone is playful and yet survival was the only motivating factor for these populations. Between 10,000 to 30,000 years is the timeline that Bernowski proposes for this exodus of sorts. All right. Jeez Louise. There we go. <clears throat> All righty. Uh, and now, finally, uh, here is the clip proper. There we go. Uh, he came before boats were invented, which implies that he came dry shot over the Bering Straits when they formed a broad land bridge during the last ice age. That means that man came from Asia to America not later than 10,000 years ago and not earlier than about 30,000 years ago. And he didn't come all at once. There is subtle but persuasive biological evidence that I can only interpret to mean that he came in two small successive migrations. The evidence is that there is no blood group B anywhere in America as there is in most other parts of the world. In Central and South America, all the original Indian population is blood group O. In North America, it is the blood groups O and A. I can, I can see, see no, no sensible, sensible way, way 
of interpreting that, but to believe that a first migration of a small related kinship group, all of blood group O, came into America, multiplied and spread right down to the south. And then a second migration, again of small groups, this time containing both A and O, followed them only so far as North America. The American Indians then certainly contain some of this later migration and are, comparatively speaking, latecomers. Hmm. All right. Should I, should, should I jump in on that? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I guess, um, and I, 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 I'm not sure what clip we re, we I recorded, uh, you know, after that. Maybe I'm just going to repeat myself. But um, I think every, everybody should check out uh, Brett and Heather Weinstein. They're uh, a pair of evolutionary biologists, a husband and wife team that have a, a really successful uh, podcast and YouTube channel called The Dark Horse. Um, and supposedly they've got a book coming out in September um, that builds on this. Um, I'm not not sure what the new kind of evidence was. I was I attended a virtual uh, university seminar where they did the announcement and they they gave much of this information already about the the two different blood types. Um, I think it might be linguistic based. I'm not sure in terms of their discovery. But um, yeah, this is fascinating stuff. I really, I really think it's it's interesting, and, and I guess uh, with Bernowski, it's really cool that he um, was trying to popularize this and articulate this for culture back in 1973. So another plus for Jacob. All right, here's Dan's comment on that clip. I want to speak for a moment about the subtle but persuasive biological evidence that man came in two small successive migrations. There is no blood type B anywhere in America, as there is in many other parts of the world. In Central and South America, all of the original Indian populations are blood group O. In North America, it is blood groups O and A. I would like to point listeners to Brett and Heather Haynes' podcast, The Dark Horse. I respect this academic duo tremendously, and they have a book coming out this fall about this exact topic. The promise is that they have something new to add to the Bering Land Bridge hypothesis. I guess we'll have to see. All right. Oops. Louise, are we there? Here we go. <clears throat> All right. So uh, the next clip is my favorite clip. This is probably my, my favorite clip in the entire series. And I, uh, Dave probably remembers this because I, I talked about this uh, in one of the, the comp meetups. And uh, this is, for Bernowski, this is the great uh, watershed in history. Uh, let's see here. Between the uh, molding time and the c cutting time. So once upon a time, humans uh, recognized their selves as powers by interacting with things like clay, which are almost point particles, and they take any shape that you want. They're, it's almost like the stuff of imagination. Any any figure you want will be accepted by clay. But you know that nature is not like that because most natural objects have an internal grain and internal structure that resists our will. So it's not it's not like dream material where it just takes on any shape that we want. So this is the great moment of maturation when humans realize that to conquer nature, they have to uh, surrender to its laws. Pit houses are dug in the caves themselves and covered with clay or adobe. And at that stage, the canyon is really fixed until about the year 1000 when the great Pueblo civilization comes in with stone masonry. That seems a very simple distinction. The mud house, the stone masonry. But in fact, it represents a fundamental intellectual difference, not just a technical one. 
and I, I believe it to be one of the most important steps that man has taken wherever and whenever he did so. The distinction between the molding action of the hand and the splitting or analytic action of the hand. You see, it seems the most natural thing in the world to take some clay and mold it into a ball, a little clay figure, a cup, a pit house. At first we feel that the shape of nature has been given us by this, but of course it's not. This is the man-made shape. What the pot does is to reflect the cupped hand. What the pit house does is to reflect the shaping action of man. And nothing has been discovered about nature herself when man imposes these warm, rounded, feminine, artistic shapes on her. The only thing that you reflect is the shape of your own hand. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're, we, we're still hovering before the climax. So that's, that's a pre-climactic moment right there. That's, um, that's, you know, imagine people say, well, the Dark Ages was, was the effect of religion and, um, I guess, a comfort. The, the comfort that the fundamentalists feel today when they hold a single text in their hand and the text has everything. So in the Middle Ages, it was the Bible and Aristotle. And so when you saw things in, in natural experience that violated what the Bible and Aristotle said, you would actually question your own senses and, and you'd think, well, no, this, this, this can't be the case. So, but what if it was clay that was the culprit? The fact that um, when you interact with clay, it, uh, it takes on your, your will and you think, well, this is something that we can deal with. Even God makes humans out of clay in, in, in Genesis. This isn't something that we can deal with. This is my, my material. And the idea of rearranging rock or, uh, or wood and then that begins a journey down finally into chemistry where, where fire acts like the blade and cuts, cuts, cuts. And then, you know, in the future, eventually, well, maybe virtual reality does this. The physical world will be uh, amenable to our imaginations in, in just as fulfilling as dream stuff. I think this is the, isn't this the, tra the trajectory of labor that we're, we're, we're hammering and reworking matter. And now we have iPhones and we have screens. And so now, now we're, we're actually talking to each other through Stargates, which is an amazing thing. It would, it would appear like magic to anyone else uh, from 100 years before. But I mean, isn't the goal to make matter like dream material so that it, it fulfills our desires and, and will embody any use values that we can imagine for it? But, but in order to do that, you have to uh, surrender to its laws and become like Francis Bacon instead of like uh, Yahweh uh, making people out of clay. So that's the first part of that clip. And here's the clip. Yeah. Let's see here. Hey, Scott, so yeah. question. Um, I don't know much about the biblical references to the potter, but what is the what is what is the reference? You, can you elaborate on the on the biblical and then other idea of the potter? Well, well, I, think, well, uh, I, think, yeah. I think the word likened to the clay, and the word for forming yotzer is the word that's used for the creation of man and we're created out of clay or earth as you remember so that's used i think also in psalms as the image of creation and creating and you know so that's like the god relationship to physicality turning it into anything breathing spirit into it doing you know any kind of form you want hmm. cool. that's right so uh, god makes people out of clay and prometheus uh, did did the same thing and it just seems sensible for us that uh, a, a creator uh, chooses the matter that embodies his desire or is his his preferred form. And clay, clay is almost perfect. It, it, it's missing color and it's missing the rigidity and hinges. So we can't articulate it into robots when it's clay. But later on, we'll, we can do that when we, when we discover the laws. But as far as figure goes, it's just as good as uh, pen and paper or the imagination. It, it's It's really... It seduces, it seduces us into thinking that that's what mastery is. Mastery is the ability to, to, to dominate clay. But actually, that's infantile, and that prevents understanding of nature. And you never understand nature unless you interrogate her and have her tell you where her, her natural fault lines and hinges are. Because in clay, every particle is, is hinged. Every particle is separate from every other. So it's like a ball of loose points. 
And that's so deceiving. So we want to have we want to have both characteristics going on at the same time. We want to have the liquid terminator, who can be completely liquid but come back, and then the molecules are now functioning like hinges, and it's solid again. Well put. Okay, well, so now finally, uh, here's the climax. This is this for me. This has brought tears to my eyes. So everyone, get your Kleenex out. Here we go. This is, uh, this is a great moment. There is a great intellectual step forward when man splits a piece of wood or a piece of stone and lays bare in that the print that nature had put before he split it. From an early time, man made tools by working the stone. Sometimes the stone had a natural grain. Sometimes the toolmaker created the lines of cleavage by learning how to strike the stone. It may be that the idea comes in the first place from splitting wood, because wood is a material with a visible structure which opens easily along the grain, but which is hard to shear across the grain. The notion of discovering an underlying order in matter is man's basic concept for exploring nature. The architecture of things reveals a structure below the surface, a hidden grain which, when it's laid bare, makes it possible to take natural formations apart and assemble them in new arrangements. For me, this is the step in the ascent of man with which theoretical science begins and it's as native to the way man conceives his own communities as well as nature. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and then he goes on to talk about um, the organization of societies, uh, the self, the family unit, the neighborhood, the district, and then the citadel and, and so on. So there's, there's, a, uh, there's, we, we, there's a pre-arrangement of parts and whole. And that's kind of what human understanding is. Human understanding provides uh, a, a, a way of variation or separation, and then it sorts parts inside that way. And so it, it has a strange ability to transcend parts and provide them with a, a background space for arrangement. And uh, so uh, this was this is a, a great moment for me. And it, it just it, and it and. Uh, and language also uh, works this, the same way. Uh, we only understand things if we, and, and this is Locke's idea, right? So, so I'm presented with a black cat and a, a green tree. And from that, I don't, get, I don't get two objects. I get black, cat, green, tree. I also get furry, tall. So the world provides complexes. I tear them apart using the, the predicate and the subject predicate relation. The predicate allows me to pull off multiple things. And then I, then I can stock a library of concepts. Then I can rearrange those concepts internally. Now, this is, this is a special kind of combination called logical combination, which isn't very helpful because what, what is, what's the hinge that's allowing us to combine red and, and triangle? It's, it's completely obscure. But, but na so nature's not like that. Nature doesn't allow us to blob things together and blob things apart in the way that language, in the way that predicates allow us to pull these things out. It's a different type of thing. Uh, so this is the great moment when you realize that nature doesn't care about your preferred um, analyses and syntheses. It has laws of its own. And the best that you can do is to be a good journalist. And like Bacon says, you, you write a table of everything that can be quantified. And then you do experiments, controlled experiments. You change a single thing. And then you see, does it change anything else? If it does, then you write that column down. And then you find correlations between things. And that's, that's what science is. Science allows you to harvest relations. You never, you never know what the terms are. The terms are unknowable. But if you know how things are correlated, 
how when you change this lever of a, of a variable's value, that this other value changes in nature. Like when you change pressure, temperature changes and, and, and so on. So we get this relational under understanding. And if you want to know what the terms are, guess what? You have to break those into parts. So we only know, we only know the spaces between things. That's, and so that's the, that's the interesting thing about this. The human is the cutter. Human knowing and cutting are the same thing. And intellectual cutting is what language does. So when we evolve from clay to stone and wood, that was the beginning of the, of the, whole, the whole evolution. Well, an analysis etymologically means to tear apart, to rip like bone by bone, right? So, so that makes sense to be using language that way. But then there's the synthetic part, which he talks about, I think, towards the end of this entire uh, section, which is that some of it, a lot of it is this intellectualization and categorization of things. But the learning is actually the physical doing of something that the engagement in nature is how you discover all of its rules by, he calls it your hands, mind and hands, right? So it's- That's like, right, that's right. Yeah. Speaking yeah, of hands, we got, we got Phil who's got his hand up, so- Oh yeah, so, sorry, sorry about that, Phil? Well, he, he ended very interestingly uh, with, with, with the Watchtower, which was like done by somebody who didn't have all the intellectual training but he kind of groped his way and fell his way to this beautiful thing that in some way nobody respected. <laughs> in fact, they tried to tear it down and then they couldn't tear it down because it was, they thought it was dangerous, it would fall yeah. down and they couldn't tear it down. And then eventually people begin to appreciate it sort of like, you could say beauty or at least authenticity of what it is. But I, I want to say something else because, you, you know, like, I'm not going to argue with all this splitting the stone and all that kind of stuff about developing intellect to find out uh, a deeper structure within nature itself. And that's how we come to understand it. But I was very curious at the moment when he did the clay and then the splitting. And I was trying to decide at what point did mankind begin to separate himself from nature, from his body, to his mind. And I think at the same time we achieve what we wanted to do, which is in a sense understanding in a sense, and therefore a kind of separation and control of nature to the degree we understand it. But I'm wondering whether that separation, and I'm not putting that down because I certainly appreciate that, but I'm wondering whether by that separation of cutting and separating, we didn't separate us. We became more and more distant from nature itself, at least in terms of our bodies. And so like, and there might be a deeper structure within the physical embodiment of the body that we uh, did not discover that thing until much later on, such as ecology. Now we begin to understand there's a, even a deeper structure that in a sense our cutting and separating has separated us, us from it because we presume that that kind of understanding, which is even deeper than a kind of intellectual cutting of the temple, so to speak, uh, did not come to being until later and I'm beginning to wonder whether that thing, when we got caught up in the ability to split and divide, uh, that uh, in some sense does not produce a culture or thing in which uh, it is too late to save us from understanding this deeper understanding of nature that we remove ourselves from on one level be because of intellect rather than our concern for uh, existence in general. So I, I'm wondering about that problem. And it seems to me, I'm trying to decide when he molded the clay, uh, when man molded the clay, he worked with his hands and he was not only intellectually discovering, but he was physically involved with the materiality of the physical rather than the tool of the intellect. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong. Can you say that again, Phil? Say that again. Well, 
when you mold the clay because it it had the form of your hands and and you movement of your hands and your involvement in your hands you are physically in touch with the materiality of the world rather than in a sense trying to discover the intellectual underlying structure so you 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 you, you cannot separate yourself from nature to the degree. You still brought in the intellect, but not to the degree. And I'm wondering whether that separation of cutting that does not produce then a separation that allows you to build civilization. I'm not gonna argue about that, right? But in some sense, you, you be, become in a sense, I'll say separate to a certain degree, maybe the enemy of nature itself. That we David? are now beginning oh, to discover, and I'm wondering whether we're discovering it too late after we already built the structure that, in a sense, separates us from nature. That's the only question I want to ask. You know, at, at what moment? What was it? Building the adobe itself already the separation, or was it really the splitting that began to be more of a architectural, a construction that separated us? I think David's going to jump in. I have something to say, and then Scott too. All on that point. So, I, it's. I, I think it's a really great question. Whether this breaking asunder of things is part of our breaking ourselves asunder from nature and ourselves as part of nature, and becoming as the agent force, seeing ourselves as alienated from the nature that we're manipulating. That that's really a, a possible thing and also as structures in society happen and people specialize in their work which they can do once this kind of structuring is happening in society it's a further alienation but maybe that's not a bad thing maybe it's part of necessary growth to see yourself because your ideas as scott said your ideas are not what is realized in nature so you're already realizing that you are something in which is opposed to what is present. You are able to push against it. So you do have a, 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 you are able to be a force against nature. So you do have to create this separation. It is part of growing, but to be alienated, I think that's an interesting question whether that had to be necessary. Yeah, okay, let me uh, pause and just put out a few kind oh. of etiquette rules here. Um, Scott and I can kind of jump in, but I think we can be more patient. Um, Gene and yeah, then Gene George yeah. have their hands up. And then once you've had your turn, put your hand down because you might want to put your hand up again. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me see. Okay. So, so the separation of mind and body and uh, with the intention building adobe or clay manufacturing something i think i think actually we're fooling ourselves in a way that we we we, we were separate or we we left our body but i think our body always have known the world like in a animal level in a holistic level we have always known it and uh, and still right now we know it even when human beings started language and started be able to intent with the intention more more planned activity still i think our body was there i think when when we when we developed more analytic language and intentional uh, uh technology i mean technet in a greek more primitive way when we did some tool making and technology i think what happened is that this 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 is knowing more body holistic knowing was as always there is this nature of subconscious knowing and then the subconscious knowing we actually developed conscious knowing so subconscious knowing is uh, is kind of uh, getting less and less attention to where it is we are, we're not aware of it and then our conscious knowing has gotten gotten exaggerated and then gotten bigger and bigger to where it seems like that's all we know but i think we have always known both way of knowing so when we made a house and stuff like houses and stuff like that, I think that's when we sep we were separated the two knowings in a subconscious and then conscious way. Thank you. George? Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I think 
the image of uh, cutting, slicing, dicing, analyzing um, uh, is a good one, and it's also a process that's fundamental to the practice of science over the over the millennia. Um, and it, that uh, you know the the term sometimes uses reductionism, pulling things apart to see how they how the individual components arise, and it's been tremendous benefit to the human race to be able to do that. But I, I do think it's it's gone all, on with also a separation, a distancing, a categorization, uh, a pulling apart. So you can lose context and you can lose an understanding of how the totality of the relationships fit together. So uh, uh, and and how do you put it back together again? I think understanding is not only an understanding of the pieces, but an understanding of how the whole thing fits back together again. And we're finding in, in complexity theory, you know, it's a lot more difficult to figure out how to put this stuff back together than it was to simply sp split it apart. And we see the same thing in the difference between biology and ecology. You know, ecology is a sophisticated network kind of process going on very, very difficult to understand. And you have emergent phenomenon that can't be predicted from the from the parts. So I think our problem in the 21st century is how do we put it all back together again? Hmm. And Jean, hmm. you had your hand up again. I, uh, am I audible now or not audible? Yep. Yes. Oh, I actually, didn't mean to have, let me see. <laughs> anyway, uh, am I audible or not audible? Yes, audible. Yes, you are. Okay. One thing that I wanted to add is that Scott says something about uh, subject and predicate. And I think that has a lot to do with this thing to where uh, we, before this, this, this conscious level of a planning activity and uh, dissecting language in a more complicated way, I will, I think that we would not be able to understand or we would not even say, be able to understand King, for example, King of Friends. This is famous phrase by Burton and Russell. King of Friends is bald. King of Friends is bald. And then somehow we are eager to say, and somehow we feel that we can say that is, that is, that is, that is false, but but if it but but that actually doesn't doesn't make sense that we are able to we feel that we can say king of friends is bald. Of course, that means a king. You know, we know king friends does not have a king, so we should not even be able to understand. But but somehow we are we are we we are we delude ourselves. We're under illusion that we understand what that means, and I think that is becoming kind of a not I don't want to use a strong word like a slave of language but somehow we are using language we were using language as a tool but then we have actually became the language have deluded us to where certain things like a king of uh, king of friends which does not exist somehow we feel so obviously we can imagine it so it seems like it is we can answer that is true or not so I think that is somehow this 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 analytic brain or intentional analytic brain go, going too far to where we are not even it's fine we we can we can we can do all that but the problem becomes when we are not aware of it and then going too far without any any control i think that's when the problem comes <clears throat> gene's referring to uh the present king of france is bald which is a sentence that ought to be neither true nor false because there is no um, referent. So it, you, it's, it's something that shouldn't even count as a true or false sentence. But in fact, we instinctively recognize it as false. And the mystery is, how is this happening? And Russell's discovery is that it looks, <clears throat> a definite description looks like it's pointing to something. But actually, there's an unsaturated variable in there. There is an X such that X is the president king of France. Oh, now we see there isn't such an X. So failing to satisfy the um, the existential uh, quantifier is the way that that thing fails and gets to be false. Uh, and then Gene's other point is uh, Wittgenstein's uh, that we're the intellect uh, um, that our, our, I guess our comprehension, there's 
the intellect is bewitched by language. Isn't it, isn't that the quote, Dave? Uh, uh, the intellect is bewitched by, by language. So because we spontaneously and automatically divide the world uh, into subject and predicate, and we have like a almost a built-in uh, a grammar, we can only we can only know the things that fit our in, internal structures. So, for example, if if you here's the famous thought experiment from Dieter Henrik, but pretend that you're in a completely black room and you see a green spot moving around, and the only property of that green spot is is it's being green. Now, you'd think that we ought to be able to identify the subject and the predicate, and, and it would in this case there would be no subject and predicate. It would just be you. In fact, you'd have to call it a green. You couldn't say that is green because that's two, right? That and green. We feel like we should be able to say there's a green, there's a green, but it, it doesn't compute. That that shows you how, how deeply we, we need to have an, always there needs to be a distinction between the referent, which is something that you point to, and then the green, which is something that you're saying about it. So even if you have an object with a single predicate as a property, you still have an internal compulsion to, set, to, to, to cut with the subject and predicate and say, no, there is a point as if it had a history, right? We can say, now the point is here. Now the point is here. That's all fantasy. You're, you're referring to it as if it were a person that had a biography and it's having many adventures as it's mo moving around on the wall. We say, that point, we could even call him Joe. Joe is green. That is entirely a, a projection from language. And uh, that's a great essay. It's called Identity and Objectivity, where Dieter Henrik shows that even under the most controlled environments, we still split experience in, in, a, in the subject uh, and, and predicate. And like, and like Ch Chomsky has argued, all human languages have this form, so, so we can't help but uh, be bewitched by it. And then, and that's similar to the issue that um, what George raised about, <clears throat> about well, the, here, here's what I got out of George's comment, having to do with metaphor, that we have to translate things into metaphor. But before we do that, he was talking about um, when you're looking at parts, you're focusing only on the parts. In order to do science, you have to you have to ignore the entire universe minus the thing that you're investigating, and even that is being reduced to one thing that you're changing, right? So Galileo only changed the um, the the uh, what do they call it slope? He only changed the slope on on his on his uh, path when he was dropping the balls, and that's what he, that's how he made his list of numbers. And lo and behold, he discovered that um, it, the the slope didn't make a difference. It uh, it, it it felt at, at the same rate. Oh, that was a bad comment. But I, I got some more comments. But uh, Daniel, did you want to say something? Oh boy, it has actually. It's there, there's there's quite a bit. Um, and I, I, you know, in order to 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 kind of sharpen this, I'd like to maybe focus my comments and the group on prehistory here because I think this is the point that. Um, uh, so we can take it in many different directions. We can we can speak about language, and we talk we can talk about primitive languages, um, and definitely we can bring up. Uh, you know Chomsky and you know Steven Pinker and and these kinds of thinkers and talk about um, what are the characteristics of, of 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 primitive language that that would be really interesting. But let me kind of keep keep this moving forward. So um, Phil actually um, helped me through something here where um, I was uh, I guess maybe enchanted with. Bernowski. I'm still a super fan. It is, it, you know, there's there's no love lost here. But what I'm trying to do is make some connections, uh, you know, to the overall body of knowledge here. And I get that the the molding of clay uh, with the human hand. It's interesting how he says it's a reflection of 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 humans. These this tool making ability that we have with and formation of of our hands. Right. So. This is not slicing yet. We're not slicing. We're not analyzing. The, the the mind hasn't been endowed, so to speak, with that realization, right? Um, but uh, I think Bernowski even says in the series, he says that there's um, the the thumb actually increases at at some point in evolution, and it's the it's the it's the ability to be able to ma manipulate and tool use. So I'm I'm throwing out to the group here the idea of this molding of the female form, right? That he was talking about about the formation of the clay. This still seems to me uh, a, a point in prehistory where we're able to um, make make tools, 
Now, what, what would be some, uh, you know, supporting evidence in that kind of a claim? Well, I would say that, you know, you could look at the, the primatologists um, and the, you know, the bonobos or, you know, the tool use that, 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 that the primates are able to use. And so it, I, I wouldn't imagine that a primate has the ability to cut with the intentionality of being able to uncover, you know, they're not quite at that level yet. And so, you know, these are really, really important things to focus on like the, on the prehistory of hum, humans. And then the only last other thing, and I know this is a bit of a jumble, but the only other kind of things that I would throw into this, this mixture of, of understanding here is um, there's a lot of other things going on in that particular period of time. From a mythology standpoint, this is where we get the 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 myth of Prometheus and the the technology was identified as fire, right? So okay, we can push that aside and we can use that wisdom. Then there's also the idea of the um, <clears throat> the the biological and evolutionary record. Where I don't I don't know when the, the the human brain size went from like one and an eighth pound to like two and three quarters pound. Uh, I believe it had to do with the um, the abundance of time eating animal uh, meat, and then the um, uh, the the extra energy so all of that i'm wondering how all that kind of fits together right you know that that's kind of how i'm trying to trying to arrange everything in a in 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 concepts and and how they all kind of fit together that's that's what i'm thinking of george yeah if i could jump in on that it's uh uh it seems like there are levels in play you know, we go from certain levels to other levels. And one of the things I wanted to observe, Scott, in your comment, you talked about understanding and you were using linguistics, but there's understanding that is it is, it is that doesn't require language. It's the tacit knowledge of understanding. And shaping clay is like that. You're you're not uh, you don't need language to shape clay. It's something you do physically with your body. Uh, but actually, the same thing is true if you're a, if you're a flint napper. That's a technique and a skill that you learn by by doing, and the fine uh, you know the fine slicing and cutting is something that's uh, not a linguistic type of a process, but it's a, a tacit knowing that you know with the body. So, I think one of the things that strikes me is when you're actively engaged with the body and you've got knowledge in the body, that's a different kind of knowing than linguistic uh, knowing. Um, and uh, and then the one question I had had for you is, what do you do with this with a sentence like this, which is uh, again, it goes back to Russell, but the the statement, this statement is false. What do you do with that one? It's one of my favorites. I love that. Yeah, well, that that's you feed that to the computer to make it commit suicide at the end of the episode. <laughs> that's, that's that's what that sentence is, is good for. But, but before we go to Phil's uh, question. I, I want to respond to uh, some great comments made by Dave and Phil er, and Gene earlier. So Dave said, yes, yes, it's alienating, Phil. That's right. But, you know, it's a good kind of alienation because it brings it brings to the fore the, the truth in idealism, which is that our models aren't the thing. And it's good that our imagination gets knocked down and, and, and abused by, by reality. That It's good that wishful thinking uh, gets slapped around and, and, and woken up. Then we get to realize that we need to be careful and be and become humble empiricists and let nature speak for itself. And uh, that's upsetting because yes, we're digesting the unity of nature and her depth into uh, into a bunch of, of of algebraic functions. And and nature is an algebraic function. And by doing so, all, we, this is other there's this Apollonian dimension. And this this remind this is like Gene's comment. Gene was talking about. Don't you know that we actually, ha and Schopenhauer talks this way also, don't you know that we actually do have a deep connection with the things outside in space? Their interiors are the same as ours. This is, this is the, Schopenhauer says, this is what Kant would, would have said if he'd, if he'd straightened everything out, is that the interior of the external isn't a forever unknown. You you have that, that same interior. So maybe there is something like a non-linguistic, knowing 
but I guess we couldn't call it knowing. There's a non-linguistic something. And, and remember, this is Nietzsche's distinction between the Apollonian and the Dionysian. The Apollonian knowing is the knowledge, like the sun, you, you put something under a spotlight and you see it from a distance and you can move it around in your hand and you're the god that sees all of its surfaces. And in, in Picasso, this is actually even spread out. So you really are the master of, of space and time and nothing is hidden from you. And if you want to know about its inner, what do you do? You cut it, you open it, you cut it, you open it until you've dissolved the thing into atoms and then you know all of it. Especially and if you if you reduce it to infinitesimals, you really do know all of it because those infinitesimals don't occupy any space. So you're the whole theater of knowledge. And the other type of knowing is the Dionysian knowing. This is a knowing of like sex and orgasm and, and drunkenness, alcohol and psychedelics. This is when the Apollonian spotlight shuts off and now you're connecting like mycelia. Now your consciousness is underground, mm -hmm. it's, it's and its tendrils are mixing with other tendrils. Doesn't that count as a kind of knowing, Gene, Gene says? And I think, yes, uh, that's that's a, a very good point. And then and then fill, fill with, with the clay. And he thinks the clay is good because the clay is, here's the way I look at it. Clay is kind of wet and swampy and it's Eden-like. And it's kind of like our innards. I mean, it's like playing with, with meat or, or viscera or guts. And so it's soft. And, and isn't there something good about this that you see your will reflected? So you punch the clay and look, instantly there's an imprint. You, you pull the clay, instantly it's done. So isn't it nice to have nature being soft and responsive and passively receiving your your posited forms. And yes, I think that's uh, that's nice. But the reason I think it's tricky is because actually it's not receiving your forms. Um, if you zoomed in on the clay, you'd, you'd see that it's it's still lawful in, in ignoring you. It's only when you zoom out far away that it seems to have done what, that you, what you wanted. So I think clay is tricky because it still has an inner structure, but it's just been broken up so much that it, it appears to be like dream stuff. Oh, uh, and someone had a, someone just had another. Oh, Phil, sorry about that. Yep. Yeah, uh, I I wonder how to deal with uh, Daniel's question about brain size and all that. Uh, we we know that Neanderthals actually have a larger brain size than modern humans, right? As far as the size is concerned, at least the casing is, is larger, and they presume it is larger. And I dare say, although I wouldn't. Uh, you know, absolutely put my money in it, that I don't think Neanderthals are any smarter than we are, uh, but but that, but they have a different sensibilities. I do believe that. And and it seems to me, uh, well, first of all, the thing about fire is important because apparently with fire you could cook things uh, because, and cooking things somehow brings out the nutrition is much more digestible than raw meat. So therefore, you could see that as soon as you discover fire, and you discover like, hey, we could actually burn these things, and actually not only does it taste better, but actually it it it, it, it makes you b feel better in a way. Okay, so so I, I presume Neanderthals had that. They also had tool making to a certain degree, but I, I think contemporary uh, anthropology has shown that. Well, Neanderthals lived till at least 30,000 years ago, okay, at least. Uh, I think probably later than that. Of course, there's some intermarrying. I think they've shown that it is actually not the brain itself, possibly, but actually the physical body. Because modern human beings are uh, built in such a way they get they could walk more upright, okay? And their legs are much more aligned, so they don't have to waddle as much. And so they don't have to be as much physical oriented to get the job done in terms of, let's say, long distance walking and running or whatever. So there was a kind of physical efficiency. Uh, now, I think Neanderthals are probably stronger. <laughs> That's my guess. So if you get into a short term struggle with a Neanderthal, it's not going to be good for you. But in terms of long term, like running away and then coming back and doing whatever and, and that kind of thing, you are just better. And I think that might have been part of the thing. One of the questions I want to ask too is about about this uh, land bridge. Not that I disagree with it, I, I think that's true. But now we have uh, the ability to test the, uh, what, what is the genetic structures of human beings. And we know that a certain percentage of it, uh, we still have uh, 
Neanderthal lineage within it. I wonder whether they tested the American Indians and the, uh, and the South American Indians and to what degree of Neanderthal is in them because presumably they left at a time when it's like probably close to uh, closer to when the uh, Neanderthal extinct, okay? So therefore, in a sense, I wonder whether that would verify to what degree the dates are that they came. Because I, I presume the further away, the more it gets diluted to a certain degree. And 10,000 years difference may be uh, quite telling, okay? And to what degree that, that not only the culture, but the, let's say their physical makeup, uh, if it's true that they retain more than Neanderthal, that that uh, than, than we uh, we presently know that that actually makes a difference in how they uh, behave in the world be, be besides the culture they do. So I, I'm wondering. So that's an interesting question. And so I, I like what he's trying to explain. But I think as you get more information and more detailed information, you need to ask those questions specifically. Or when did it happen? You know. I'm not so, well. I think I think the bracketing between uh, ten thousand and thirty thousand years is probably correct in a you know general way. But I, that's I like a great question, that. Phil. You, you need to write that down and then send that out because that's that's a good testable question and it's actually interesting to see what percentage of Native American DNA contains Neanderthal in it because that, that could provide information both ways. Because if you know the migration time, you can pinpoint Neanderthal better. If you know Neanderthal well, then you can pinpoint the migration time. So you need to write that down and send it to someone so that they can include you in the acknowledgments on their paper. Okay, George? May I, may <laughs> you I you can steal it from here? me and write it because I'm not going to do it. I got other things to do. <laughs> but I think you're, that you're one is already up. answered. Oh, I'm sorry, Jean? I think that one is already answered in a way that the are Europeans, so Africans have zero, and then, and then all human beings other than Africans have somewhere between one to three or four that's a famous person pavo is the neanderthal the neanderthal experts and he and i think the max planck institute they figured it out already they calculated to where agents have lower percent because because of the the human family uh, tr uh uh travel because of that so agents have like two percent and then europeans have most three or four percent so that one is actually a famous thing well, that's kind of interesting because I do this with a grunt, though. <laughs> no, but that, well, that, that's kind of, that's kind of interesting because uh, that means, in a sense, Africans are more modern. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Oh. Neanderthals, so. <laughs> like which is well, we if that's the case, then in some sense, at least in a biological sense. We got it wrong and we oppressed them because they that's were right. Like, that's really, we need to call up the, the Trump supporters and let them know that because they're always trying to associate <laughs> proximity with primitivism. Y'all never left your home, y'all lazy blacks. Um, uh, George. There, was, uh, there was material in uh, Jared Diamond's Germs, Guns, and Steel about that that the uh, speculated that the, uh, the genetic diversity among African tribes right. is actually a lot higher that's right. than the genetic diversity across the rest of the world. And that's because they were evolving in pools mm. in Southern Africa before there had been any migration north of the Sahara Desert. So that, uh, you know, the, the genetic pool that drifted north was a lot nice narrower thing. than what was left in Africa. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's kind of a whole different animal. But there's some been some speculation about Neanderthals that I uh, ran into a few years ago. Um, and uh, the speculation is that they were anatomically different. Their faces, their brain structure were different. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, characteristics of those features is they did not have the same capacity for linguistic manipulation and language, but they had uh, faces that were much more expressive. Mm. And in fact, one speculation is that they're the part of the brain stem that, that carries emotion went directly to the face. So their faces 
showed you exactly what they were thinking, or they showed each other what they were actually thinking, and they didn't need language to the same extent that wow. modern humans did. Wow. And the modern humans, the, Cro the Cro-Magnon, that whatever it was, the modern human that came along uh, <laughs> and ultimately extinguished the Neanderthal had a different structure of the brain, and it, uh, there was separation between the facial muscles and the cognitive functions, so they were much more linguistically oriented, and also they were capable of lying. Yes, yes, I think. Yes, yeah. So, some interesting speculation about um, why, That's perhaps, it, and also the, the larger brain structure, but but less linguistic. Uh, some speculate if you you know if you ever read the Clan of the Cave Bear, speculate that the Neanderthal actually had a much richer spiritual life than the than the successor. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I know that speculation, but I believe that actually in a way. And, and it's sort of interesting because not only if that's the case, because they're a little less capable of lying, because you would just see that, no, no, that's not true. <laughs> I can tell it in your face. But also, if they didn't have as sophisticated of a language, which I certainly believe, then in a sense, they also don't have that linguistic thing that allows you to tell lies as easily so so, so the, the yeah. double whammy right yeah, yeah. so you yeah. got you you got attack them and, and then that you could tell what they mean and we could just sort of like oh uh, you know like i i really like you yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's another there's an even deeper speculation that potentially uh potentially the neanderthal were the progenitor adam and eve in the garden of eden and uh, and when the 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 new humans came in, uh, you know that they then were able to take from the you know to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that was the fall. Oh my God! So, and if you can start, if you can lie, you know that's a good indication that you're already fallen. So I kind of like that analogy. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to uh, back up Phil's remark about the standing. I did yeah, about ten years ago. Someone wrote that article. I remember it. It was it was not this or that brain feature that caused the the, the human cultural explosion, but it was the detachment of the arms and hands from locomotion. When you have uh, primates that are always standing upright, you have these are the things that accelerate brain growth because uh, mm -hmm. because you have these these manipulators and they're just dangling there, and you have all the stuff around you, and then. I mean, how many ways can you digitally explore material nature? And then the brain is the thing that's going to determine the exploring. So then now, finally, there's a use for this extra surplus intellectual power, and that's, a, that's to operate the hands. There's a, uh, that reminds me, there's a model that was, that's, uh, I can't remember where it was, but it's a sculpture in, in clay. It's a sculpture of the human form based upon the percentage of the brain capacity that's dedicated to that to that mm -hmm. part of the body. Uh, there's a particular name for it. You can probably look it up on the internet, you know, something homunculus. And uh, the head, of course, is large, but the hands are huge, as you point out. The hands are these monstrous, because they mm -hmm. that so much of the brain is dedicated to what happens in the hands. So it's a kind of Macrabian projection rather than a globe. Okay, okay. it's interesting because I, I, I saw a video where, where they talked about, you know, how human beings begin to come down the trees and walk. One theory is in a sense that they were kind of smarter or the climate change that they, they had to come from down a tree because they can't swing from one tree to another. The, uh, but but the one that I liked that was kind of interesting is that we were by nature just weaker and we got thrown out. <laughs> so we were thrown out and that we had to like, like live in the ground where it's dangerous. So we developed walking because we have to like begin to start running away. And we also have to uh, develop way of like working together and, and, and developing tools because like this is a dangerous place. If we could just climb up a tree like, okay, leper, <laughs> come and get us or lion, you know what I mean? And so that's kind of interesting that we were actually, in this sense, thrown out of the Garden of Eden. <laughs> you know, our, our competence is our uh, flexibility. I mean, the brain is the most plastic thing going. And uh, basically, we're, we're uh, 
in control of our own firmware to a large degree, right? I mean, uh, we, we can program ourselves to whatever we're going to do. This is, uh, and we can do it symbolically and abstractly now that we have language, but uh, we pretty much know we're doing this. I, your brain, you know, is a reflection of it. I don't know how much we can define something by the, the brain structures, the sizes of the previous brains. I mean, I know Einstein's brain was analyzed. I think it's here in Philadelphia, a significant amount of this uh, study. The, there's one extremely prominent feature that's unusual about Einstein's brain. There may be others, but the one that uh, I've always heard about, have you, have you heard about this? Descartes. His, his left hand, his left hand, he's a violinist. Oh. So it's highly mm -hmm. developed, unusual. I, you know, yeah, I thought I think we're talking. There's a there's a book called Descartes Bones that <laughs> talks about what happened to his body. You know, he died up in Sweden, and then parts have gone missing. Uh, he he apparently had a very small brain. So it's just and and he uh, doesn't think, therefore he is not. <laughs> Gene. Yeah, I wanted to push back a little bit on the upright walking. And the upright walking is Homo erectus, and that was two million years ago. So that was that was way before even Homo sapiens or Homo habilis or any of those. So I think human, you know, also also two twenty oh. 200,000 years ago, that was the Homo sapiens, but also 50,000 years ago is where all this exploded. So, mm. and then also I heard something that the Homo sapiens times one versus Homo sapiens times two, Homo sapiens sapiens. So that anatomically 50,000 years ago versus 200,000 years ago, Homo sapiens, I heard in many sources that actually doc, if you give a cadaver to doctors, they won't even be able to tell any difference whatsoever. So whatever difference is something that it is not physical, that it's something that happened. They say that it's neural connection. That's what, and that's so far what I, what I, what I related to. So upright walking and, you know, of course, you know, a fire and all that. So those are, we're talking about millions of years, millions of years ago to where, 50,000 50, years ago, that's that's when people's creative, or I would say, you know, borrowing what David's word, uh, symbolic thinking started. So I think that's that's where all, all you know, art, the, create, the, the beginning of so-called art, artistic and all that started. It seems like that's the symbolic, symbolic thinking is what, uh, what, what kicked off all this to where then in that case, if it's a neural connection, then it is impo it's impossible to be able to physically detect. Hmm. Well, we, 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 I think we split off from chimpanzees, presumably, or uh, ape that's like it, about 7 million years ago. And we right, began to split, right? Ago. And that actually... 7 million years ago. What? Yeah, 7 million years ago. Yeah, 7 million years ago. And in fact, in a way, we developed a tree in which, of course, we're, we're on top. Why shouldn't we be? <laughs> but in fact, bonobos split off later than uh, than, than than we from chimpanzees, and uh, that that split off. I I was explained to me that what happened was uh, at that time, somewhat shorter than that, uh, the uh, African there was a lot of disruption. And that what happened was the Congo River formed, and it was a quite a barrier. Uh, and uh, some chimpanzee lived uh, on the east side, um, east side, and, and then the bonobos, I think, were on the west side. And on the east side, there happened to be gorillas. And the west side, there wasn't. So that in order to adapt to an environment where you have to have where you have gorillas, which are I guess by his nature passive, but you 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 wouldn't want to make one angry. Uh, you you have to have an aggressive beast to, in a sense, fend them off. You know, words, the bonobos, lucky enough, they were living in a calm situation. And they don't need to be all that aggressive, and they developed a society that was much more uh, friendly. You know, make love rather than war, that kind of thing. So so I, I think it's kind of interesting how 
how how accidents of geography, which is not within our control, uh, in some sense, at least in the early stages, uh, made the difference. And I think that we, I think that's one of the reasons that why we had to push ourselves to develop tools and all kind of things, in a sense, to separate ourselves, right? The, in fact, to even create a, a city wall so we're protected. And for a long, a long period of time, certainly up to the Middle Ages, nature was this dark, deep forest <laughs> that is like frightening to a certain degree, right? And it's like only now will be, we, actually later, now that we begin to understand that nature is actually very important to us. And it's too bad that we're beginning to lose it. So, so with, uh, it, nature is in some way, once you adapt this situation, it, it, it's it's kind of an enemy that you have to tame, you know? You have to tame and you have to domesticate, you know, so that you could control it. So we're in the, we're kind of a control freak of nature. I, <laughs> I just wanted to add basically uh, uh, a symbol, the importance of symbolic thinking mm -hmm. or just basically be able to communicate things that does not exist or the sense of time, the past or the future. So that to me, it seems very interesting. So I just wanted to add that part. Well, you know, look, I'm Chinese. I, I don't know my Chinese now, but but I had a lot, a lot of trouble when I came to this country to, to actually appreciate tenses, right? You know, I, you know, yesterday, you what I mean, you know, we, we have past perfect and all these kind of stuff. And, you know, uh, you can say, uh, you know, have you eaten yet? Did you eat? And all that. It's like, uh, I, oh, I ate yesterday. You know, I, I ate. And then the Chinese, like, that, in, in one sense, there's no problem. Like, when did you eat? Well, I, I eat yesterday. <laughs> you, you don't have to say, I've eaten already. You, you, you could use other words. But I think what the what the problem with the Chinese, in some sense, without being more complicated, is that uh, the past perfect and the future perfect is more difficult to get to, which means it limits imagination. You know, if we were in, you know, like, and then you have all these past and present, you know, fusing together, we can't even distinguish. Uh, instead of the simple time, we have like a multiple <clears throat> time that creates imagination, which I think is an interesting thing, you know? Yeah. Tomorrow, yeah. tomorrow after the movie, I will have eaten my lunch. That's right. If you have helped me yesterday, right. I would have that's helped right. you. Subjunctive conditional. But, but that's another, another mistake by language. Just because Chinese people, and then I'm Korean too, we don't even, you know, state a subject most of the time. That does not mean that we don't that we don't have a concept of subject. That doesn't mean Chinese don't have a concept. Of the, it is just uh, the the linguistic linguistic marker is not there. But there is a you know there. Right. So I think that's actually another proof that that there is an illusion of language. So human the, Wittgenstein said it's a form of life. So we all are human species. So we all have a certain biological human form of life. So basically we have the similar biological, uh, so to speak, there is an underlying structure to where we, as a, as a human beings ever after, ever since 50,000 years ago, they say, the, the researchers say, we do have a sense of time. So it doesn't matter if your language seemingly superficially does not have the, all those tense, still, I think we all have it in the same sense. Right. The world, the world is not all that is the case. It's what you have inside your experience is all that is the case. So it's really the whole attitude of language is this external thing that, you know, is the, the way it works. We're going to define the tubes and structures. No, it's about how you impress on that other self, which is the same as yourself, the same thing you have going on inside you. It's just how do I make the same, how do I mold that clay over there to the same shape I feel on? And that's, you know, and any way I can do that, I can do that. And I don't understand how people learn English and come here and you're told there's a present tense. And to bake in the present tense, you say, I bake, you bake, he bakes. 
and no one says, I bake cookies now. You don't <laughs> say right. that. Yeah, no one uses the simple tent. It's always, it's always the progressive. That's right. Yeah, I got it. And another thing is that uh, English language always have this the versus a uh, versus none of yeah. this uh, or the. But they're really, in a way, I think the Chomskyan way of saying is that it is just an accidental <clears throat> thing. And uh, that is not all that meaningful like some people crack up to be. I, I, I just recently heard, heard, saw this video about, is this the Ziff uh, paradox or mystery or whatever? And uh, he started with the word the, and he says, uh, that's the most frequently used word. Uh, and he says like, I think one out of, one out of every 16 words or one out of six, one out of 16 words, it's uh And then what's surprising to me is that he went down, what's the next? And it's like, it, it progresses in a kind of geometric curve. It's amazing. Like, wow, like, well, you know, like there's, there's something going on that we, <laughs> the, the, the most often used word is one place and the next one is like, you know, so, and then it slopes down, but in a very, interesting curve and and he said this ha happens to all sorts of things that has to be something in a way that mm -hmm. has something to do with our brain i mean it's like it, it, that kind of accident doesn't happen that way you know without some kind of alignment of some sort i used to i used to teach typography i'm not a linguist but i used to teach typography and i used to tell my students you know like that alphabetic language it's a very important development in this sense. Now, here, here's where it begins to be, the abstraction becomes more important than, let's say, even Chinese or, you know, or pictographs, is that you start with things that doesn't make any sense, you know, because, you know, like any letter is make, made of like actually a geometric shape in a way. And then you put it together, you have a letter. But a letter doesn't mean a damn thing. You have to put it together, something else. So we in the West are trained from the very beginning, once we begin to read, in a, in a way that doesn't make sense, but it's totally abstract. We start with abstraction, and we get to the concrete by way of abstraction. Whereas if you have, like, Egyptian uh, and that kind of pictographic language, you start with the concrete, and maybe you build up to an abstraction, Mm. But you do, but the, the 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 direction of the development is in reverse. So we could deal with abstractions or deal with symbolic language in some sense, in a way more more slowly at first, but becomes much more efficient because we could actually make up all sorts of things that doesn't even exist, and we could put it together. So the the, the in a sense a randomness. Uh, trouble us less than if you were in a concrete world and that's kind of an important idea now I, you know, I, I argued before that being so random is also removing yourself from the the world as well because you're now living in a world of abstract ideas that because that's where you begin george has got two hands up now so well, actually I three three fingers one one is i learned recently that finland finnish the finnish language doesn't have any future tense either yeah. um and uh, uh, I also wanted to comment on that, the, uh, the distribution that you talked about in terms of the number of words. That's a power law distribution. And in complexity theory, it's found to be very common in, uh, in anything that has a network structure. So power law distributions are everywhere. You want to yeah. you want to learn about the nodes on the internet. You want to learn about social influencers. You want to learn about it. It's all got power law distributions, which is you know kind of a cool thing because here is a mathematical concept that's abstracted from things that are already abstracted. I think I think it's pretty neat. Um, and the last comment I wanted to make is you know I think there's an evolutionary component to languages and uh, and different parts of the world and different cultures are obviously have been have been shaped by shaped different, by different kinds of, of, of complexities. I'm sorry, there's a train behind me there. Uh, so it may be, you know, we say English is such a chaotic language, um, so, so much chaos to it. It evolved in a very chaotic environment. And that 
I, I suspect that the Chinese language evolved in a very different kind of environment than mm. English language. So they're different. Yeah. Well, I, I think Phil's comment is very interesting because you're saying that uh, in the West, human children learn that units mean nothing, but meaningless units can come together to have meaningful complexes. You would think that shouldn't the units also be meaningful so that you have a meaningful complex, but then if you look at the units, they're also meaningful, but actually no. Uh, in, in, in the Latin alphabet, the letters are absolutely meaningless. And so we, and so maybe that gives us an advantage in scientific method because we're used to the mm -hmm. idea that, you know, these parts may not have any damn meaning at all. But look, look at the emergent is so rich and full of meaning. <laughs> so, so we're comfortable with the idea of, of I guess something like radical emergence. We're comfortable with the idea of of parts bearing no resemblance or being completely arbitrary or being completely unlike the final emergent product. It's it's okay for us. But it's, it's imagine molding a language with your hand. You'd, you'd want to be able to make the, the written thing say what you're saying, right? You want it to express the way you're expressing. There are languages that are completely, totally, honestly phonetic, literally phonetic. I mean, English fails, but that's the attempt, right? To simplify to the mere 20 sounds that you're going to commonly you know and convey everything. With the littlest, you know, I know it sounds abstract, but, you know, um, putting numbers down on paper is also abstract, too, because it's the actual loaves of bread that are three, not the three. But there, you know, that's I'm writing the, the order or the receipt or whatever it is. So I wanted to recall that for you. And if it recalls the shape and the sound and the m, the making of the m, of the m, like, the, you know, the way water trickles in your mouth goes, then, you know, it's the physical command to do that to you. So you know, it's not seen as that arbitrary or that, uh, you know, it's an attempt to make it as easy as possible because to master the Chinese typewriter, now there's a skill. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah right. Well, no, I'll, I'll, well, 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 right. You so what I was trying to say, what, what I was trying to say is that abstraction uh, allows you to, in a sense, try to make sense out of, in a sense, nonsense, right? In other words, you, ha you are able to put together things that may not have anything to do with anything, but you have to make sense. In other words, one of the things that human beings are supposedly good at, at is recognizing patterns. So once you have nonsense, you could create like, well, there's this pattern or that pattern, but it may not fit the world, but you're very good at that because you're, it, it's kind of like, you know, like I used to, I used to like Roger Staubach, like because, and I actually don't like football because, like, football seems very corporate. There's a formation, you do this. Uh, it seemed very 19th century mechanical, but I like Roger Staubach because when when the corporate structure breaks down, when the military structure breaks down, he's very good at improvising and inventing and scrambling and like. I, I get you a pass, which is sort of interesting because, like, I, it all depends where you're good at. It's like, in some sense, you know, like, you are able to scramble out of situations. And you are, uh, for, for instance, how we, we defeated Japan is that Japan has a very rigid code, right? And uh, But the Americans, like, you know, heck, we, we have to invent things on the spot because things are not working. You know, we got to invent something to put in front of the tank so they could break down the uh, head, 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 head roaches, uh, roads. And so all sorts of things that are on the small of the moment, that is a good ability that you are, up, especially if you are in, a, in an invented world already, which is also coming from, from abstraction to a certain degree. So I'm not saying that that's necessarily good, but it's certainly good in a civilization we have already built, right? Yep. Uh, I, I want to make a comment that goes back to long ago, like 20 minutes ago, living in trees. I thought this was just a fun fact. That's all this is. So does anyone know where generalized anxiety comes from? What, what the current best evolutionary psychological model is explaining generalized anxiety? I probably, I, I mentioned this before, so you, you probably already mentioned this because it's so funny. Like why, 
what, what are the evolutionary conditions for producing Woody Allen or people that are just constantly and generally anxious? Where, where is that coming from? Any ideas? Because it, it doesn't seem like a good trait, does it? Anyone? Are you, saying, are you saying we're falling out of our trees while we're sleeping? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. That's right. How do you know that? Because it scares me to think about that. So I got that general anxiety, high anxiety. That's exactly right. So, you know, you know, when you're falling asleep and sometimes you twitch and your arms flail and your legs fell out. Thank God that you have anxiety. Your ancestors died to, to, and so that the ones that had the mutation may live. So the ones that panicked like that when, when they were tilting on the branch, those are the ones that had children because they didn't die from falling. So that's why we have general lines. So don't go to the therapist to get rid of this wonderful gift from the ancestors. No, no, sure. I, I, have to, I, have to, I have to pause for uh, an interruption from our sponsors because this was, in fact, this was the reason why we, we uh, well, mainly Scott came up with the idea of high ontology, right? So that's, that's where it came from. <laughs> and, Right. Well, 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 then, and, and our, and our sponsor is actually Pfizer, and it's uh, a Prozac. So we um, uh, we're we're going to be all loaded up with as much Prozac as we need to dull in any of the sensors for. Uh, yeah. This is, this this is, a this is this this got to be a commercial. I can't believe it actually is a commercial. So uh, no, <laughs> they, they ran think... experiments with they ran experiments with baby, you know, like. If you put them, in, let's say, a, a, a glass, and they're up high, they recognize that that's dangerous. In other words, it's inbuilt within us that, yeah. in a sense, that is a source, and that's one of the things they're afraid of, even before they know what the hell yeah. it is. Yeah, because it's it's actually why within us. So anxiety, in a sense, really is fundamental. <laughs> and Scott's saying, Scott saying it's, it's related to proprioception. That thank goodness we have uh, the distinction when we're sleeping about the real proprioception. And this is a popular that, topic in self help and pop psychology today. Everyone in the world that's selling some stupid self help system on the internet always begins with, you know, you program for anxiety. Back in the old days when you were living in the wild, it was important for you to think that death was around the corner. But now in today's comfortable civilized society, when you're trying to pick up girls at the grocery store, you can't do it. You panic because your damn ancestors were so well wired with their anxiety. So join my system and we'll be able to turn off those genetic triggers and you'll know and you'll be a dull, non-anxious person and you'll you'll be able to, to be a, a winner and successful and proactive and extroverted in today's world. Everyone well, says that. Have you noticed that? Well, Prozac do that. Look, look, here's here's the thing. I want to I want to stay on David's point, though, because and if, if he's making the association uh, with proprioception on 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 Scott's point. So the proprioception of, of, of being able to um, imagine your 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 body, uh, you know, I guess uh, visualize your body. Right. I guess it's kind of a way to simplify it. Now, here's the thing is that then you're you're acknowledging that there's um a, a bridge of a of a conscious and subconscious or sleep state in that that's really fascinating, that's fascinating. to me mm -hmm. i think that's worth ex expanding on a little bit here well it's it's awesome that when you're asleep you can experience anything but scott's saying that it's evolutionarily been very advantageous or we're here because our ancestors when they were asleep that particular feeling they had enough of a strong reaction to to override everything else that they were thinking which you know in a dream you just follow the dream but in this case they were going to interrupt because gravity was calling interesting yeah well what are the what are the, the best the, i say one of the best there's i if you you know that moment where you're just about to fall asleep right and then you know if you get you know jerked you know, maybe you're on an airplane or something or you know you're not set properly it's like that's one of the worst feel i mean not worse like painful or anything but you know i have a daily routine right you're being yanked up or you know pulled out of consciousness in that sort of abrupt way but you know this is really interesting that you have this 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 mechanism that moves you through that pulls you through the matrix right mm -hmm. Well, we needed it. We needed it, right? For that moment, maybe that's what we need. Or we need to be uh, jolted to life every now and then. 
Yeah, well, there's, there, it brings me to the point, I don't know if you've seen that, you guys should look it up. There's a skit that Joe Rogan does about the, the dolphins. He's on high, he's high on stage and he does this thing about the dolphins looking at him. He's like paranoid. He's like, why don't they ever can't catch a dolphin by accident with a fishing rod or, you know, something like this, right? Anyways, it's just hilarious. But the, I think of other sleep states with other mammals and you know, if you've been, I've been on a catamaran in, in, uh, in Hawaii, you see these dolphins, they're, they're, they're going and they're swimming beside the catamaran, but they're asleep. Oh, yeah. So these other kinds of sleep states, it just happens that, you know, ours are, you know, we, we evolved in the caves or in the trees or whatever. So, you know, the mechanism that, that pulls us into reality is that's very fascinating that it could be anchored to, uh, an anxiety response. That's like really cool. It's an interesting question about awake asleep because I mean, there's another thing which is non self conscious consciousness, which is just plain consciousness, which is different from what we're usually doing. I mean, and it's a state. So, I mean, sometimes people would describe it with they're playing their instrument, having a flow, whatever it is that that flow is, you're conscious. And it sort of resembles dreaming hmm. is so i'm not sure about the distinctions i'm just i'm out of my depth here well i i i heard a speaker he was he, he was doing research I, I think it might have been on sleep but but he was talking about he was doing some research with ducks you know ducks they, they sleep and and what they do is they sleep kind of in a group and the and the and the duck on the left side would have the left eyes open <laughs> and the right eye asleep and i guess the ducks in the middle would have two eyes closed and the ducks on the right side would have the right hand, uh, eye open so in a sense you know like so the, this is kind of protect there's somebody Who's who's always awake that gives the warning, more likely from something you know. I, I, unless you know you figure out a way to tunnel underneath and come up in the middle, then you really got them. <laughs> so that's so kind of interesting. In other words, they figure out a technique. Mm, that's amazing. Of, a group technique of uh, of avoiding that situation while they're trying to get at least some sleep. You know, of course, if you get in the middle, that's the best. <laughs> Imagine coordinating that without language. That's right. Well, that's what I was thinking. That <laughs> emotion, emotion is communication without the yeah, word, yeah. and it's it's meant to uh, turn a group as a you know as a single consciousness to an issue. Like you know, if you're, I guess, laughing is is not the most defensive uh, thing, but it's it's something that everyone feels, and when you're in an emotional state and express anything emotionally, it's supposed to get everyone into the same frequency of reaction mm -hmm. and focus on the same harm or danger or whatever. So it's a way to move a group together, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and it's like, well, how does a flock or you know of birds turn simultaneously? How does a school of fish do it? It's it's uh, whatever kind of awareness you have of the contact around you, you're open to that channel. So I mean, language is a really inadequate way to do that kind of thing it's you know well you know i i, I remember what, what this guy was a, a part of researching he was actually researching quantum entanglement whether that ex exists in living things because you know he, he was curious about how birds fly too i mean it's like it's not like you know one and then then everybody follows it's like it's like simultaneous and he thinks that they're probably is some short, at least short range quantum entanglement between birds that somehow they have kind of a sense perception of some sort that allows them to fly in a flock. That I think this, I think this is a sentence that doesn't know if it's true or false. I, I, I'm, I'm highly skeptical on that, on that piece because I think the, the best um, response that I've heard on it, it doesn't mean that it scales that. Right, so we can acknowledge quantum physics. We can un we can acknowledge the fact of entanglement, but it doesn't mean that it scales into. Uh, like I said, he's researching that. Right, I'm not yeah. saying he's yeah. proven it. 
right? Yeah. Well, so, but of course, our popular media will automatically grab it and say, you know, if it's spookiness at a distance or there's something, and now all of a sudden I've got, you know, a home cottage or like a cottage industry of health self help books, right? I mean, it's happened with like the theory of relativity too, and all of a sudden there was, you know, all these offshoots of well, everything's relative, and you know, it just it. it you know, well, but, but but he is a serious scientist as well. Yeah, you know, I yeah, I, I get it. One thing I want to bring up to the group here, and I thought was really fascinating. I don't know who brought this up earlier, but with the um, uh, the 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 facial features of and display of emotions from the Neanderthals. Yeah. So so let me let me say, how, how does this sound that the that that the the evolutionary advantage of language for the the, the sapiens um, had had more to do with the transmissibility of that uh, you know through time, as opposed to you, you think I can only make uh, a, a facial response to Scott, who can then he receives the totality of that information, but language can transfer, you know, for for you know much longer, right? And so it goes into the sing songs and then it eventually gets into, you know, the Homeric epics and all these kind of, you know, stories. And then they transfer and this is the, this is the this foundation is the of culture, right? But facial transmission doesn't do that. You, can, you can't talk to more than three people facially, you know, he lets, right? You can't talk to the person behind you. You can't, you know, you can't communicate. That's and, yeah, and there was something that Phil brought up a long time ago, and I find this would be uh, in the beginning of the of the of, of the meeting. Uh, and I find that this is a an odd question that comes up. It says, "Well, you know, maybe we're too rational. Can't we ever go back to maybe our primordial roots?" It happens in you know uh, the the Heidegger course that Scott and I were in with with Tubinek today too. It's like, but I find this like. A, a, a weird kind of direction. Well, yeah. Why don't we just go this direction? Well, to me, there's 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 an abundance of this evidence in the animal kingdom, ladies and gentlemen. Right? Like we are the abstracting species. This is what makes us different. You say we let's go back, let's go a different way, let's get connected to. Yeah, you know what? That's the naked mole rat. <laughs> like it's a there it is. There it is. So the difference but, is that we're abstractors. But, but, but no, 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 wait, no, wait, wait. If we end all and be all, then we might be missing something, right? I mean, it's well, a great yeah. tool. No, right? no, no, wait, 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 wait a minute. I, I have to respond. I didn't, get, I didn't to get David's point. I want to hear David's point first. I'm just saying it, it's, it's a, a powerful tool. Obviously, it's a nuclear weapon, but it doesn't necessarily say it's the solution to anything. Other than being a tool, if, if you know, if we make it our end to be abstract, then we're sort of we are, a, you know, separating from nature in a way that means we can take ourselves out of our own being in a very seems to me in a negative way. I mean, we have to figure out the whole thing, do the whole thing, right? I, I don't know. I'm I'm biased towards this whole thing, uh, where abstraction. Yes, it's like a focus. But what about everything that just was being brought into that focus? The re, the world is the infinite complexity. The abstraction is the ultimate simplicity. Hmm. You want to only live at one end of that telescope. That's all. I, I I have to defend myself because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that. You might be able to retain this idea of abstraction and working with numbers and all that rational stuff. I'm not against that to that degree, at least. But I but think, I think, but I think but, that one might have to approach it in such a way that you don't totally abandon the other thing. For instance, we have music. I mean, you could say that's intellectual, but it's really mostly a kind of emotional thing. The other thing I want to present is like, uh, you know, it, it, for instance, like the American Indians, I really feel bad for them in a way. It's like they have a whole nother concept. Maybe it's because of underdevelopment, who knows? But, you know, like we came to this, this uh, land and 
and, and it was actually philosophically justified why we could take it over. Well, it, it was John Locke. I mean, John Locke didn't mean it, but they took his concept because he was a Protestant. He believed in property and ownership and all that kind of stuff, right? That good stuff. And the justification is the American Indians live on the land, they live off the land, but they never work the land. So they never improved the land. It was just free. <laughs> so you could just take it in a way, right? But they had a different culture that understood the relationship with the land is much more open. And we should have been more kind, even if we want to educate them in this sort of uh, a progressive analytical thing, that we don't wipe them out. We wipe them out, not because of intellect, but because of another uh, a sort of emotional thing, a brutality uh, that, that wants to take everything from something else. And so if it wasn't for the East Coast press who saw this as a, as, as a terror situation, I mean, we wouldn't have American Indian problems because they'd be wiped out. The UN declared the crime against American Indian was genocide, and we would have been successful if it wasn't for somebody who actually said, no, we need some more compassion and all that. So that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying abandon it, but what I'm saying is that separation sometimes produces a, a, a kind of insensitivity to other things, other beings, other human beings for exploitation, because we're not, we, as sophisticated as we are, we are not ruled by reason. We are ruled by passion like everybody else. And those people on top, they're free to take things from somebody else because they have more power. So power is the thing that does it. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Just be more sensitive to other values that might not only be more kind to other people, but at least might actually be more helpful to us at some point. Look, I, I, I don't like playing this, this postmodern commentary very much, and, and everybody in this room might take this as something um, uh, really abrasive. But I think there's a, a description that I can make about postmodernity that that says this yeah. we're in a, a unique position in time where we can defend um, uh, the 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 atrocities of our ancestors as if um, you know dominating their lands and occupying their uh, you know, like you, you gave the example of, of the, the North American Indians. Well, history up until that particular point in time didn't give a shit about that, <laughs> right? Like, you know, it was all about domination. It was all about whose culture was the strongest. That's what it was about. And so one of the conditions about post-modernity is it says, hey, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Everybody gets a shot. Everybody is entitled to life. Everybody gets a certain amount of prosperity, and it does. It makes me sound like a, a like a jackass. It makes me. I'm just observing that this is a this is unique to uh, to post modernity, right? This is this is unique to this is the most um, representative in, of my mind of uh, of, of post modernity, and and it becomes especially visible when we start to bring in, for example, conversations about climate change, that the solution is that every country has to be, you know, has to be elevated to a point of prosperity so that we can all get along and we can all live in a, a state of, of utopia. And I wonder, who's the guy that puts their hand up and says, look, actually, it's just mathematically not possible. Wh well, who's the guy that says we have a population problem? I do. No, but but you know we can't we can't have we we live in a society where we can't like what are the implications of that conversation that we prioritize certain human lives over others? It may be running in the background program, but we can't talk about it because what you know what what's the next step for us? 
evolution. Nazis were Nazis now? No, evolution of some kind. I mean, the, the value of every human life being worth something uh, is, is not a new value. It's an old value that no one lives up to. Mm. Right? Yeah, there, so, there, are, there are people in the 16th and 17th century that were all about indigenous rights and not anti-imperialists. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, Phil's point was made by uh, Horkheimer and Adorno. Phil, it's, uh, if I may uh, restate what you're saying, is that this ability of us to divide and conquer, which works so well in the laboratory and also in agriculture and, and tool making and all this, uh, is, shouldn't be turned on humans. Uh, other human beings shouldn't be part of the um, uh, the, the spectrum of objects that, that we uh, that we want to uh, dominate under our instrumental reason. But that's exactly what capitalism does, especially with with the, the Taylor and the time and motion studies. It, it's almost comical, isn't it? You're trying to you're taking the human animal and you're trying to maximize you're trying to maximize uh, you minimize the wasted motion at, at the conveyor belt and in, in the factory. And you know, you know, you do experiments where you lower the wage as much as possible. Are they rebelling yet? Do they, are they able to have children? Can they feed the babies? Because we need more workers in the in the future. So this this is, this is a good point. Yeah, we, we shouldn't use instrumental reason. We shouldn't apply it to other human beings. But of course, there's there's no argument for or against. There's no argument for this ex except ethics. So I mean, if if someone is is a capitalist and and they realize that their family's wealth depends on this and they're living like they're living parasitically and and they're just owners without having to work they will have some very good arguments about why those people um, should be treated as um, value suppliers. I mean, I'm sure they can come up with them. I mean, I'm sure that if, if we talk to Milton Friedman or Fukuyama or someone, they come up with a very good tiny argument about why those, those people should be paid minimum wage and I, and I should be able to not, not work but live off dividends. So just like there's income inequality, there's morality inequality. There's an uneven distribution of the concepts that perhaps in this conversation we share, but the rest of the world kind of uh, just passes off as that quaint moral attitude sometimes people take. You know, why is there this uneven distribution? Why is it unimportant? Is it? Be, I mean, I can understand morality becoming a little less important if you're starving. That's supposed to be the reason morality becomes slightly iffy or questionable to deal with because you're being attacked. Okay, now you have to consider taking life or you cannot survive. I mean, is that the position we put most of the world in right now? I mean, then they have an excuse. Well, look, there's no question that we have too many people in this world. The question is how do you reduce that without, without being inhuman? And I would extend this beyond human beings. You know, like we treated animals in in this excessive way throughout. You know, like I, I'm ex I'm extending otherness to other things. Now, I think what we need to do is not only figure out some humane way of reducing the population, but we ought to figure out some way to reduce our needs to at least a degree that we can handle it to a certain degree, right? In other words, we are living in an excess world. And we want it that way because we're so passionate about it. That's the first thing we need to do is, is to control ourselves to a certain degree. Now, I will admit, I will admit that there's a limit even to me, right? I am not willing to live on $2 a day. And even though I, I I acknowledge there are many people who are living in two dollars a day, some even one dollar a day, right? I will admit that, but I'm not going to say there's there should not be some point to which you could actually pare down, so that the the world could endure the shock until we make a transition to a certain. Degree. That's that's what I'm saying. I I've always said to people that I was glad in a way that was born poor, right? And I didn't need as much as a lot of people would think, okay? So therefore, in a sense, I'm not excusing myself and saying I, I am like the virtuous person I don't actually consume. I do, and I I do ex consume probably more than, well, 
absolutely more than the world average. But there is a point in which you could, you know, you, you contribute so much to the overconsumption that it really is a problem. So if we've laid out the parameters of the problem, we know what it is. It's a matter of having the right number of people and providing everyone with the right amount of supplies. Now that we know the answer, which we knew before we started, how do we get people to conform to this idea? I got the solution. That's what I want. I really, I really do. If you, if you guys would, if you, if you guys would take a deep breath, and let me kind of sketch it out for you. I think I've got something that would really work. Now, the mind, the mind space you need to get into is the mind space of World War II. So we treat this like a war effort. And we're not fighting an enemy. We're coming together as a common, as a common species to, to fight uh, uh, climate change, for example. And, I, and I, part and parcel that goes with that is biodiversity loss. Okay, we need to have um, a, a synergistic relationship with with our environment. It needs to be sustainable, basically. Okay, now if and this is the big if, if we as a species value human life like we claim to do, then we need to. It's not it's not rocket science. What are the things that we need to supply every human with? food and probably secondarily like uh, housing and stuff right but let's focus on food and food supply chains for a minute and now i say a military like intervention to say that we we secure food supply lines okay and we make sure that that everybody has good healthy food Okay, we can imagine what that looks like in America. We can imagine what that looks like in Canada, where I am from. And I don't know if anybody else is coming from any other country. But first of all, let's figure out food supply lines. And what model do we have to kind of back this up or to, to, to go to? Well, you know what? Look at the way we've transitioned from COVID. A lockdown, an isolation, people are at home. They're not commuting to work, whatever the fuck that is, right? wasteful uh, efforts, what do we need? What is this big push for increasing GDP? What is it for? What is there, there, there's the reason is, is that we need to have people that need to be fed. They need to live beyond a week, beyond a month, beyond a year. I think uh, Phil and David, you guys are both retired. Okay, what do you need for retirement? You have a house, you need food, you need an income for what? Do you need to buy shit from Amazon? What do you need to buy? You know, so what have you been able to sustain yourself with in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a situation in a COVID kind of environment? A reduced economic kind of reality. That's what I would paint as the framework to move forward, but completely a state uh, military-like operation to sustain and maintain food supply lines conscription for younger people absolutely what do i tell my i've got two boys 16 and 12 years old what do i tell them to do you're going to go join the army you're going to go join the war effort and what are we going to do we're going to maintain supply lines we're going to get food to people and feed our population that's what i propose and uh anything above that it's like, hey, it happened in wartime. What are we good at? We're good at making war. We're good at going to war. We've done it before. We, have, we know the mentality. It's just the enemy is not each other. That's what I want to popularize. That's what I want to, you know. I don't know what your intuitions are on it, but it's like it's a starting point, and nobody – I, I want to gal galvanize something around that and, and mobilize and grow that as a movement. Is I don't see any other way. Yeah, Fr Fred Jamieson came up with this idea, I guess, five or ten years ago. Zizek wrote the introduction to the book, 
It's called the uh, Universal Army. So uh, all America passes a law and everyone becomes, everyone is drafted, which means what? It's socialism overnight. So automatic housing, automatic food, and, and that's it. Everyone has some minimum hours of work. The Wall Street Journal says we need to do four hours of socially average labor per day. So you do your four hours of work a day, and then what do you have? Well, there's no more homelessness, schizophrenics are getting medication, uh, everyone has housing. And then of course, if you wanna make extra money, you can do that by doing whatever you like. Yeah. So, so the, the infrastructure is all there. All you have to do is officially become a member of the army. And when you do, then you get everything that an army member does and, and what Congress members do. You, you get you know, health care, food, m m income, you know, all this. You get all the basic stuff is, is taken care of. But you, have, but you have to do it in a way so it doesn't look like socialism because Americans have strange fantasies about socialism. Well, uh, the, the, pro the problem I see, well, l l let me turn this uh, hand off. The problem I see is that you might be able to get a lot of people, maybe, to join this movement, but there will be people who disagree. There will be people, and, and that's the first thing you have to figure out how to control, right? You at first of all have to be international, because if I was rich and I want to stay rich, for whatever reason, I'll just go somewhere else. Hey, this is good. Bring a lot of money with you, that kind of thing. So you have to you have to discipline it to a certain degree. You know, to get rid of the excess element. I mean, that is kind of a, it's kind of like a, a ultra martial law to a certain degree, okay? So a lot of people will be able to argue, well, that's martial law, right? <laughs> okay, despite the, that's because they're doing fine. So uh, the get enough people, we can't even get people to agree on democracy because like, the invading the capital. Oh, well, that these people are just like tourists. I mean, like, come on. I mean, like, you know, like we find all sorts of excuses that if I want to not join the movement, I could figure out enough arguments in a sense to win over a lot of people who will resist because the ultimate answer is because they don't want to give up the luxurious lifetime because they don't want to think about all those people in Indonesia or wherever, Bangladesh, who's suffering. So like, okay, so are you going to be able to succeed with, let's say, 75%? Okay, I'll put a good number. Okay, I'll, I'll even go up to 80%, 90%. You got 10% of people who are essentially criminals about human beings. I mean, that's what it is. And you have to then figure out a way to control them on, to some degree. I mean, are you then going to like, okay, you, we just can't educate you. It's execution time. Then are you also becoming inhuman? I mean, like it, it's just a problem. I, I, I think you could convince mm -hmm. some people. That's true. But as I said myself, at some point I won't even agree, because like two dollars. Are, are you kidding me? Two dollars a day? I mean, come on now. I <laughs> mean, like I, I, I literally cannot survive in two dollars a day at least in this country, right? Literally cannot. And part of it is because I've gotten used to what I'm used to, but part of it's because like the prices and everything is so different that you have to change so many things. So I just think it's difficult. I, I, I think it's a, an important idea. The more people can be convinced of it, perhaps maybe slowly there could be a movement, but we're in a desperate situation. You know, we can't wait a hundred years when it became like more and more people integrated in this way of thinking. Like, like, like I said, you know, yeah. once you develop a structure, you're kind of imprisoned in that structure. That even the people who agree with you, but the people who can't even see that that's a problem, they literally cannot see it because they think like, what's what's wrong with it now, right? Yeah. There seem to be plenty of Americans who have no interest uh, in whether or not 11% of the people are starving in the country, let alone anywhere else. And if you solve that problem, I'm not sure we get you a single vote. So I don't know how you would implement the system or you know how you see it evolve. I, so I do. I see that there's going to be nationalistic differences, right? So there's a U.S. military. And there's a Canadian military, you know, there's a, I think we have two tanks. So 
there's, <laughs> you know, Indonesia is going to have their, you know, their state military, right? So the way I would base this is I'd look at the average income uh, for an American citizen, which I believe is $60,000 a year. That means everybody gets that. The easiest thing is you just make it for everybody. The U.S. military is now focusing on domestic as opposed to international relief. First and foremost, they want to make sure they're getting their they're feeding their population. Now, that's the that's the foundation for the entire world. Now, there are certain countries that just cannot feed their own populations. Well, then that needs to be an application that comes back to the rest of the world community. I don't know how that's negotiated. I'm just I'm saying you know. You, I think it's too, like, for example, okay, Phil, you bring up an excellent point on this. You say, I'm not going to go and live off of $2 a day, and I don't expect you to live off of $2 a day. If you want to sell it to the people, you have to basically say, hey, guys, guess what? On the other plan, you were supposed to work until you were 55. Guess what? Scott, you're an academic. You got tenure. It starts tomorrow. What the fuck does that mean? Oh, it means you get to go and research and study and learn and you know what? There is a free market. The free market is on ideas. It's not a drawdown on our economy. There's still market. All the beautiful and amazing things that emerge from, from market activity, it's still there. It just means we don't incentivize with people uh, in, in our own countries starvation or hunger. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and but the capitalists, the capitalists control the media, so they're going to they're gonna do their hardest. I mean, they have so many, so many resources, and they have so many good actors uh, pretending to be news anchors. They'll try their hardest to convince people that it's better to keep playing the same old game. Are you kidding? I mean, that's, that's what all of culture, all of culture is political machinery disguised as culture. So well, would you suppose that with the amount of free labor that exists in the economy right now that's unemployed, that would be sufficient to carry out the operations of the plan? Or would people who are currently working need to sort of stop their worry? Like if they're working in pharma, they couldn't be developing the drugs. If they're working in hospitals, they couldn't do Or maybe there are certain professions where they would keep their jobs with other people. And if you're meanwhile, if you're making a certain amount now and you have a house, and you say, okay, you're making 60000 now. Do you keep your house and the mortgage is canceled? Is that how it works? Uh, so on the, on, I don't, that's a great question. I don't know if we'd, you know, wipe off the mortgages or anything like that. Possibly. I'm not sure. I don't, but it, I don't think anybody should be taking people out of houses. Right. I think if we had a political, if we had a, if we have, if we had politics, which encouraged people to say, Hey, you know what? We do need help in the hospitals. We need volunteers to come. So you think about the army, you've got the officers and then you've got the enlisted people. I think the enlisted people should be young adults, about 18 to about 25 years old. The idea that I had, I'm not saying it's set in stone, but I said is something like this. If me and that you know beautiful young woman that I want to spend the rest of my life with, right, we decide to have a kid, well, I actually can stop working under this plan at 25. Okay, then I can go and be a fucking poet. I can go and do whatever the frick I want to do. Okay, I got early retirement at 25. If I want a kid, that's 10 years more work that you have to be involved in the army, whatever we want to call it. Okay, so now you're up to 35. You have two kids, you're 45. You have three kids, you're four. So it's not punishment. It just says that, the, you know, there's, there's an economic reality here that means just like in our current system, you don't get to retire if you decide to have a, a family. You, you need to pay for their school. You need to pay for. So that's kind of how I would suggest setting it up. Well, well that's a specific economic structure to de incentivize having kids so that you reduce the population in the short term. Mm. Yeah. And that's, 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 that's an immediate plan for the short term reduction of people. And, you know, if one country adopts it, they immediately shrink their population. Right. And presumably in some way raising their style of living, which makes more one of people come there. And no, but I don't think that this, this military should be considered something that's like like punishment. It should it, look, we have like a, an organic movement that says, hey, you know, I want to go and volunteer. I'd like to go and get, in, you know, involved with saving the planet and helping animals and all this bullshit. Right. OK, so. I shouldn't say bullshit, right? But it's, you know, there's all this kind of things that are growing organically in society. The feel good, you know, 
sort of movements, right? But there's no Super. conservative backing to it. This should be the conservative mentality. This should be the status quo from 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 the conservative sensibility to say, look, we need we need help, right? And so you say something like to 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 somebody like Scott. You say, Scott, what do you want to do? Do you want to go and enlist in the army and, and you know in, in this in this war relief effort to help save the planet? And you say, well, Scott says, actually, I'm better served getting on Meetup and learning and studying about Kant and spreading the word and, you know, convincing people and using my intellect. That's what I want to do with my time. Like, who decides? Like, one of the greatest things we need in the United States is housing, right? Who runs the programs? The five-year program? I mean, I, like, uh, how do you get the right things done in society, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean... Do you have a housing industry that does it kind of, or do you have a government agency that says how much housing you need based on how many children there'll be or what? And what kind of housing? I think, I think that the, the idea of housing has to be advocated. I don't have the answer for that. That's a really complex one about how to, how to supply housing shortages. But, you know, we live in a weird society anyways in Canada, in the U.S., where we have huge empty spaces of houses. We don't really share any kind of communal kind of... But here's the thing. Trying to force a culture to change and say, actually, you know, you grew up wanting to have, you know, a split-level bungalow with this and a jacuzzi in the backyard, and now you actually have to conceive of, you know, some sort of, like, need of a longhouse, I think is just, like, ridiculous, right? So... The, the, you, you have to look at the, the, the number of changes that you implement and realize that the further you move away from the norm, there's, there's diminishing acceptance. And what I'm saying is that if you, if you push a program forward that says, hey, actually, you, get, you, know, you just get early retirement. There's somebody that's 37 years old that's thinking, what the fuck am I going to do right now because I'm in, in a COVID reality and I don't know what I'm going to do or how I'm going to feed my family. It's like, hey you know what, the answer is not to go to the factory and produce more Nike shoes. Well, like, uh, look, I, I, think, I think the real problem really is, I don't know if it's solvable, because basically we are all greedy to a certain degree, okay? And some are more, even more greedy than others, because we want, we want things. And I, I remember, you know, I was, you know, I was teaching at one time, this was in the, in the late 70s in the Midwest, in Iowa and then Kansas, quite conservative places compared to the California. I came back and visited my family here and uh, had a discussion with with a group of people and some of them were, were women and they were very liberated women. So I said, you know, like, I, I gotta tell you, you know, things in Kansas are not the way it is here, okay? Mm -hmm. That you know that if it was imposed in, in, a, in a certain way, like if the world was totally liberated, there'll be a lot of women who are not capable of handling that transition, right? And uh, one person asked that. She said, uh, "Well, you know, like I can't think of a better time to be a woman these days, women liberation." And this was like, you know, like, like I said, in the, in the late 70s. And she says, as a woman right now at this moment, you could burn the candle at both. <laughs> right? right. You, you could be treated as a, as a original, normal woman. You know, people do things for you. But you could also be liberated and all that. And I said, wow, you know, I, I, I remember uh, Edna St. Vincent, the Malay's, uh, uh, you know, famous statement is that you can burn the candle at both ends, but I wasn't applied specifically to this. And I said, well, yes, I said, yeah, that's true for you because you can live at both worlds and burn the candle at both ends. But some women are going to get their asses burned from both ends. And they're your sisters. What do you think about that? And I think that Despite the fact that very liberal and liberated women, they they sort of said, "No, this is still the best situation could be." Right? In other words, if you could burn the candle both ends, why not? 
That to me is not the greatest compassion. You might say, well, maybe we should rethink how we transition to that period, right? Rather than what, so what I'm saying is the, these are supposedly good people, but still behind it is like, well, no, this will give us an edge, right? Whether that's a parent or, you know, real or whatever. But nonetheless, the way she said it, it's like, wow, you know, that's kind of interesting without thinking that others, other of your sisters are going to be burned at both ends. Like, wow. That's what I'm saying. Now, this is from supposedly good people. <laughs> you could imagine how the bad people would be thinking. So we always have to think about ourselves. Like, how far are we actually willing to go? Because we are not you and I are not totally good. We do want something, right? And the best you could do is keep it under control. You can't possibly say, yeah, but, no, I'm going to transform myself into this. Sort yeah, of but like, Phil, Phil, here's the thing. Imagine World War II, yeah. right? and, 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 and we were thrown into the war. And I'm saying, I'm, I'm bringing myself as an honorary American, okay? We, we entered the war a little bit differently. But Pearl Harbor happened, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now we're committed to World War II. Did we sit down and say, well, wait a minute. Actually, I really don't give a shit. We had, you know, I don't want to give up my cushy little house. I don't want to do this. There was an urgency in society that says everything is at stake. Everything is at stake. That, what's, that is what needs to be conveyed to people. We have the scientific evidence. We know what's going on. We know we're on a crash course. So the, the, the conversation is moot. It doesn't. It, it doesn't translate into into well. I might be slightly bad. I might be slightly evil. I might take advantage. Look, there's not gonna. There's not gonna be a. No, 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 no. There is a difference between scientific warning and all the arguments you could do and prove you do, and it's not as concrete as bombs falling on you. That is concrete. Of course, you're, you're right. going to be motivated, right? No, you're right there. You're right. You're right. You're right. 20, 30 year projection about the disasters that are going to occur statistically in various parts of the world and how many tens or hundreds of millions of people being displaced in 30 years is different from 2,000 people died in a bombing yesterday. You all are, yeah. you know, fleet has been attacked. And, and, right, right, right. And yeah. it's, I called that last time we were talking. I said that is the frontal cortex demand. You're demanding the awareness of a problem, which is not in the temporal frame that we live in the normal world. And that requires scientific sophistication and a highly developed mental system, which uh, we don't, human beings only work by doing it wrong and getting smacked down. And so I don't see how you get them to cooperate with global yeah. warming problems. I mean, the kids somehow, the kids have heard it long enough that maybe it's seeped yeah. in at yeah. a deeper level. I mean, we were talking about this issue when I was growing up as a kid 50, 60 years ago, you know, but then they dropped the ball entirely. I mean, we didn't even go to the metric system. We didn't preserve any species. We didn't stop doing anything. Yeah, Scott, what do you, what do you help us out here? We need your intellect. Yeah, well, I, but 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 I but I think I, I think communicating I think communicating is important. Like we might have all the science, but we have to com communicate the urgency of that. The problem is we don't have control of the media. We really don't. I mean, the control powerful that? people, the, the powerful people is going to always have control the of the media, and they're going to like use it like, you know, like whatever if you couldn't believe. To prevent that, or at least slow it down. Until and and e even things that aren't obviously propaganda are still propaganda. Like, like, look at all the soft ways and sideways ways that Fox News used to get poor white people to vote for Trump, That's just nice. because he, he pretended to be he, that he was gonna he was gonna exterminate blacks and Mexicans. He doesn't really care about blacks and Mexicans, but he 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 postured like he was gonna he was gonna wipe out all the blacks and the rednecks were so excited they're like that's enough that's all I need to hear and they and they voted for him because they were they were cultivated that way by Fox News. Well, the hopeful side of that is people can be motivated, but I don't know that they can be motivated by climate change as the existential issue because there's no feedback 
to them. They thought they had feedback that their jobs depended on keeping immigrants away. They had feedback. There's no feedback to the climate stuff. It's all your tomatoes won't taste anymore, and it won't be this in the way in the future, 10 years. It's not, you're going to die tomorrow. You, know, you don't the, have to well, well, the, well, the thing is, the day, the day will come. And that's why I've been saying, like, is it going to come too late? I mean, for us, our consciousness. Yes. I mean, well, that's, that's like, what the real problem is. Like, that's, I, I think I think there's enough signals that people who understand does understand. Maybe not the degree of urgency even we should have, but they understand. But it's going to be so difficult to get it through people. When, when the volcano begin to erupt, <laughs> even yeah. if you're a rich person in Pompeii, you want to get the hell out of there. They're still not getting vaccines. I'm sorry if anyone here is against the vaccine, but I'm just saying, you know, there are 580,000 people dead in America, this part of America, sorry. And there's still like 30% of Americans aren't interested. They don't have the time, not that interested. How can you convince them of something in the future? This is killing people yesterday. I know, but but why does it have to be a consensus? There's the tyranny of the majority is ruining, and you know, is the tyranny of the majority is is contaminating the, you know, the the direction of the, you know, the rest of the the country. And at what point is that an infringement on our rights? You know, like is it a death sentence when thirty, you know, for for, uh, it's a possible death sentence, you know, for people in my family or people in in Dave's family or Phil's family or Scott's family. When, when when people don't you know want to partake in something like this, Daniel, what is the use of their their privilege in a democracy? Just but, 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 I, what is the estimate is that only one out of twenty people is going to be rational on this? But, what but, do you but, do with but, but, no, but what's t more terrifying to me is not even Trump and the ultra right who's going to go along with it, like Congress itself. Well, at least, there's going to be some relay people who actually are that way in Congress. But the people who know better don't fucking care about democracy more than saving their fucking jobs. They know better. They were elected to do their jobs, and they're not going to do their job because they've been bought off, they sew off, whatever. That's the thing that's actually more terrifying than, let's say, a dictator like Trump who is trying to call for these things because you can Alex at least fight against that. That's right. That's but when, right. Yeah. But when, but when but when the chorus begin to sing with him, then like man, I said this. I mean, their their the job was supposed to call it straight. Their job was supposed to believe in democracy, whether democracy is actually the better government or not. They believe yeah, that. Right, they yeah. should, they should believe that. They're not defending it. I, I just. You know, like, yeah, the, the, the reason they're in politics is for the kickbacks and yeah. the, the gifts and the lobbyists and the power. And that's it. They have zero interest in helping other people. Zero. It's mafia ethics. They only want to improve their family situation. And they would be happy to, if they could press a button and annihilate whole whole segment of the population. They do it gleefully while masturbating. They have no interest in helping people. There are enough let, of them. Like let me let me throw one situation, one thing your way, okay? And oh, that, Bernie's an exception. I mean, th there's some people like Bernie that are actually exceptions. I mean, I mean, m m m yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he really has the moral compass, and he's conquered his sense with his reason. So Plato was right. We're going to need to have to have people in the government that aren't going to blow the capitalists for any small hand up they, they could get, but are going to stick to their principles. Oh, then you know what? There's only one thing wrong. Bernie accidentally became old. And saved money, and so he has a million dollars. He's a millionaire, so Fox can go after him. That's right. That's right. <laughs> he's hypocrite, a hypocrite, Bernie Sanders. Yeah, I knew they. Yeah, yeah. He's a flaw. He's got a flaw. No, but, okay. So I want to. I want to bring up the point. So, so David or anybody who who looks at this plan and says, "Well, it's not a practical plan." Okay, and I don't know if this is the best example, but let's use Karl Marx for for an example here. Okay. So you have Karl Marx, who is um, undiscovered. Nobody knows who Karl Marx is. He's uh, was he a reporter or like a writer for you know uh, uh, a newspaper, or whatever else. And he's freezing in his apartments. He's you know is is you know he's living in poverty. He has no idea what his words are going to do. What you know what his legacy is going to be later on. And so. 
we have to ask ourselves, do we put something together because we say, oh, fuck, it's not going to work? Or do we put something together and try and be as rigorous and thoughtful and deliberate about what we're trying to do in the hopes that even when the shit storm comes, if inevitably that's what it is, that we've done some good work and we put some good intellectual you know, thought together? No, no, I'm, I, saying, I, I'm saying this, 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 the new school from Frankfurt is coming to meet up. I'm saying I'm we saying start it right here tonight. No, 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 no. I, I, I agree. I agree about your calling, but here's what I'm going to show you about my selfishness. Right? I have other things that I'm an artist. I have other things I feel that I need to do just for me personally, as as, as your calling. In other words, your calling is to actually help the world. I, I applaud you for that. My calling is to save my own soul, you know? And, like, that's an important calling, too. So, I mean, yes, I'm willing to devote some time to your calling, but I have my own calling because I kind of think that the world is about spirit in a, in, in a way. Now, I'm not going to say Christian spirit. I'm just saying the human spirit. So, like, to ask, like, no, and I'm not going to compare myself with Beethoven, but I'll just use an example. To ask Beethoven to go fucking join the army <laughs> so he could work in a soup kitchen, like, I'm not so sure that that's a wise thing, you know, you're, even, you're, even, if he, even if you admit You're missing my point, himself. though. There's a point where people, like I said, with, like people with you, Scott, and David, you guys are over an age restriction. You can go and just be artists. You can explore culture. Right, go do that. Yeah, there's, there's uh, Phil. You make a good point. There's, there's alternative like reworkings of Marx. There's autonomous Marxism and um, anarcho-Marxism, where they actually say that the way to pull this off is to be even more self-valorizing and even more self-interested, and and just jump into non-alienated labor. And then, as, as the cops try to attack you, to tell them, you know, join me, brother. So, so it's so it's it's like the opposite of Jameson. So, listen, Jameson wants cradle the grave security. He thinks the most important thing is to, is to have material needs met. But then the Republicans are so exciting. Their commercials are better. They have sexier, more dangerous ideas, more exciting, like Mission Mission Impossible type stuff. So, the so the the, the way you compete in a marketing world with Republicans that have good production value commercials and sexy newscasters and stuff is to provide something that's more adventurous and more exciting than cradle the grave security. And and that would be something like something like what the what the right is offering except you're, except it's it's you're doing it for yourself and and you're you're not for example you're, you're not giving 20 percent or 30 percent of, of your of the value you you produce to some uh, employer but anyway it, it doesn't have to be this heavy-handed top-down command model blah 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 there's, there's other 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 ways of of, of of pulling this off that's that's more atomized and capillary like well, but I but but I like but I like the f fact that he's committed to what he does, and he's actually issuing a calling for others to join him. That is a good thing. Now I might stop myself from joining, but I'm sympathetic, at least sympathetic to his calling, because we need that calling for things to even begin. I think that's important. Well, there's lots of people agree with that. And like Dave says, what kind of impact are they making? Go to the Greenpeace website. And I mean, they have, they're, they're, they hand out flyers when they can. They're on the sidewalks here with their clipboards almost every day. And so what do people do? They laugh at them and say, fuck you, I'm not going to give you any money. And, and then they're actually happy to do that. And even I experience joy in, in not giving money to people on the sidewalk with clipboards. I mean, I, it's like I, I must do it out of principle. So it's... So uh, yeah, Dave's question is how, how do you get how do you get apathetic, cynical people, or, or and, and Phil's question is how do you get normal, self-interested people to sacrifice and get on board with with a program like this? I mean, I, aren't the Greens in government in uh, Germany, and you know, haven't they acquired some political power? I mean, I think democracy can be a solution to the problem, you know, because democracy can override capitalistic urges. Uh, the will of the people might be to save ourselves. Uh, you know, my particular gig in my state is to make voting fair, to uh, fix our gerrymandered state. You know, that's a, but it's, it's a hell problem. It's an awful, terrible, 
problem because the people who have to vote for it are the people in the legislature who control it and it does them good to suck all the power and not let the people have the voting power. So it's a real fucked problem. So I mean, state are you in? Pennsylvania, one of the three worst gerrymandered oh. states. Wow. Well, at least they voted the right way. Come on now. It's not that bad. I mean, there is Texas, <laughs> which is much worse. Well, no, we have a majority Democrat state, and we, we're used yeah. to having like uh, 13 Republicans and eight Democrats in the legislature, you know, in, its, in the Senate. So the court, which happened to be Democratic, overruled and said, this is a gerrymandered. Uh, you have to redraw these districts. And they did. But Guess what? It's a new census. They're going to draw them now again, and they're going to gerrymander again. So it's just a constant battle because it's go and fight it in the courts after it's already the voting patterns built by the people in power. So the only way to change this is for us in Pennsylvania, a constitutional amendment, but our constitution in Pennsylvania is one of the most conservative and difficult documents to change, more worse than almost any state. And it's just been impossible to change for three years, haven't made any reasonable headway, even though like eighty percent of the people want to change. Well, no, no, no. One of the one of the problem with the Democrats is that they're not they're not willing to fight dirty like the Republicans. Okay? And, 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 I, and I understand that because to do it is to become like them. Okay, I understand that, but it's like I remember several years ago, you know, when Clinton was running for office and Trump, you know, that gang, and I said, "Be careful." Watch out for the Supreme Court. The Republicans have been spending years preparing to change the Supreme Court so they could change everything, right? And I remember a guy who apparently know a lot about politics. He says, oh, man, that's a difficult thing to communicate to people. I mean, you're, you're wishing for too much or whatever, okay? And, I, and, and sure enough, Clinton laws, you know, and I actually accused, I mean, I know Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a good person, okay? But I actually accuse her of being selfish because she should have retired. Now, you could say, well, she made a mistake because she thought Clinton was going to win for sure, right? But you need to understand your own vulnerabilities as well. You're yeah. old, you have had cancer, all that kind of stuff, right? Like, play it safe, at least to keep the seat. But, you know, like, then we all worship her, which, which I do also. She also made a mistake, and that caused a lot, okay? And we're not willing to spend years working on the lower courts, working on the, you know, the local district governments to build up this base so you could actually steal the election, you know, because, well, that wouldn't be playing fair with gentlemen's rules or whatever, right? And here's what we got ourselves into. And now we have to, like, fight back, at least try to fight back at least somewhat dirty, I mean, because the dirty people have won. They keep winning because they're willing to kick you in the balls. <laughs> That's and, right. And if, you, and if you act dirty, you might get some of the rednecks on board. They, they might get excited by that and be like, hell, the Democrats got balls. I'm going to vote for them because they blew those guys up or you know something like that. That'd be great. Yeah, it's hard to know what sells in America. It, it could be the most ridiculous thing, and that and that'll win the vote. Just like some offhanded racist remark, and then boom, suddenly you get you get a bunch of, of fans. It, it's really it's hard to know what these people in America are so stupid. There's so many flat earthers and imbeciles in America. It's, it, it's hard to know. You'd have to have a, a gigantic marketing department to know what retarded flat earth bullshit thing you'd have to say to win voters for, uh, to get votes from different people in different areas. But Facebook knows. Facebook knows how to, you know, you need to talk about UFOs here and lynching over here, and then all those people, you get them on board. Yeah, but none of that's intentional. It's all just algorithmic. It's just the outcome of tuning their algorithms for eyeballs. It, they didn't try to convince anyone of anything. They just couldn't help it because their algorithms work that way. They don't know what they're doing. But I'm saying there, there, there's, there is an existence, a database that would let us know how to speak to get votes. Well, you know, but the pro the problem is that so many things started out presumably to be optimistic, and because they're in this particular structure, they eventually get bought off. You can't help but being bought off. I mean, like, you know, like so. Then you start working for the money, and then pretty soon you don't care about the standards because if you 
if you're not bought off in a funny way is that somebody else would you know right. what the internet company is going to be bought off and they're going to run the gamut and you're out of business i mean it's like i mean like i hate facebook because of that right but i think a lot of those people remember how optimistic we were when the internet came out it's going to liberate people communications and all that like it was very optimistic everybody was very optimistic just finally the dam's going to break but they were bought off I mean, people are so ready to get bought off. I just can't believe it. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have to raise. We're gonna have to have. We're gonna have to raise philosopher kings. We're gonna have. We're really gonna have to put put them in some type of a dome. We're gonna raise them in Epcot Center, and then you know, we can use electroshock to, to make them totally averse to bribes, and then set them free, and they can run the government. <laughs> Otherwise, we're screwed. Because because who could resist a, a good enough bribe? If the bribe's high enough, who who is the person to res who would resist it? Whoever's happy with yeah. what he has, right?